now to introduce the first um, speaker and one of the major organizers of this event. I think this is really, really important. Um, he has gone uh, all out to make sure that we are here, the, this hotel, this location, um, you know, getting all these amazing people from around the world to make sure that we're here. And he's the chairman of the board of Oslo County Regional Part of the Norwegian Humanist Organization, uh, rep representing one of the largest or uh, organizations, humanist organizations in the world. Um, he is the founder of the secular think tank, uh, Domencraft. On a separate note, he's also a massive Bayern Munich fan, which I found out this morning. So if any anyone's into football or soccer, you can go and <laughs> soccer for some of our North American colleagues. Um, you can go and talk to him, and he will educate you on how to pronounce football. Um, but he's someone who, um, honestly, along with Marina Marzi, he has really gone all out to make sure this event is possible. And he has really highlighted the importance of you, what, what we would say non-Muslim atheists uh, to collaborate with ex-Muslims and elevate their voices, um, share ideas, and cross-pollinate. So without any further ado, please give it up for Morten Goldberg. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is uh, Morten Goldberg, and uh, as he said, I'm representing one of the uh, organizers, the local part of the organizing committee, uh, the secular think tank Demokraft, and I'm also a representative of one of the main sponsors, the uh, Humanist Association Humanitisk Forbund. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what I want to talk about is why I'm doing this and why it's important to celebrate dissent and celebrate dissenters, both those here today and those depicted uh, who couldn't be with us due to either being imprisoned or persecuted or having passed because of their activism. Why we have to use the platforms we have, we who are privileged, who live in secular societies in the Western world, freedoms and liberties we take for granted, such as the liberty to speak, to liberty to dissent, the liberty to believe what we want to or not believe at all. Uh, we have to use our privilege, we have to use those platforms to help elevate those who aren't as fortunate as us, those who are being persecuted for their lack of faith or just because they oppose a regime or the ruling regime's faith. Um, so I, I think we have to we have to all pool our resources and and use that and we have to do not take our freedoms for granted and to me the cause of the ex-Muslims is our generation's singular most important human rights cause because these are people who are fighting the fights we fought and won 50 and 100 years ago here in countries like Norway and our, our nations and our inhabitants have been all the better for it. Uh, so I think we have to use that platform and that position to help help make everyone ex uh, enjoy the same rights that we have. Um, so I'm very grateful for the Humanist Association for giving so much money, <laughs> pretty good, because that's that's part of it. That's part of just you you know making logistics happen to getting these sort of events together. Uh, and I'm very happy for everyone who is. A lot of people, although everyone here is doing this pro bono, so this is sort of a community sense of everyone coming together just to help to be, elevate this vital course. Um, I am an atheist, and I think there's a misconception about atheism and atheists that we don't have a spiritual dimension to our existence. Uh, but when I attended Celebrating Descent in Amsterdam in 2019, I went down there with my good friend and colleague, Shabana Rehman, who is, this conference here is dedicated to her memory. Um, I did feel certainly a, a spiritual connection and a spiritual, spiritual dimension to that experience, because being in the same room with so many free thinkers who shared my values, we didn't look the same. We had such uh, different backgrounds. We came from different parts of the world, from all over. We had different upbringings. We had different cultural codes. But we all were brought together by this sense of wanting the best for each other, wanting, wanting the best for humanity. We all wanted everyone to enjoy basic universal human rights. And, and that, that was a spiritual experience. I felt it. I felt it, uh, it to the core of my being how important it is to help get together and fight these fights. Because if, if we don't get, if, if we don't pool our resources, 
If we don't stand together in these, in these fights, then the Trumps and the Putins of the world are going to make easy pickings of us because there are a lot of regimes, there are a lot of autocrats out there who, who want power over people, who want power over resources, power over nations and continents, and they're not going to stop. So we can't stop either. We have to keep fighting. And I'm not going to say very much more than that because I don't think this is the podium for me. I'm doing a lot. I'm a logistics guy, I'm booking things and organizing things, and I'll leave the room to people who, who need the platform, who need the podium to speak, and whose voices are far more important than mine. So that's all I'm going to say. Enjoy the conference, get to know Oslo, get to know each other, build some networks, and get out there, and keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now have uh, Shaquille Rahman, who is the leader of the Center of Secular Integrating. Uh, he's also the brother of Shabana Rahman as well, and he has some, a few words to say. Uh, I'm trying to speak in English, but uh, it's not uh, what I'm used to, but uh, I couldn't say no to Mariam and Morten when they asked me to say some words, so I will try my best. Uh, I didn't know I was getting uh, uh, so emotional when I came here, uh, because we try, family try to not think about Shabana so much, because it happened so suddenly. We lost her so suddenly, it's uh, two years uh, now. But uh, we try to keep away. I don't see so many videos of her. I don't. I try to. We try to don't see so much uh, pictures uh, because she was not just sister. She was also friend and uh, a person who helped the family when we have some conflicts because she was so intelligent. She was my younger sister, but she was a, a person in family everyone goes to. So when I met Mariam now, suddenly I started crying. I didn't understand why, but it's because she reminds me of Shabana. She's like Shabana. And I know Shabana was, would love to be here. When you played that music, when we came in, and a woman, I don't know your name, Nadia, Nadia was dancing, I got emotional because Shabana would love to be here and dance with you. So I will dance with you when we have <laughs> chance. A lot of things I'm going to say, it's not, uh, uh, you know about that, because a lot of people here talk about that every day, and you, can, you know these values much better than me. So you know what I'm going to talk about, and, um, but we have to talk about it. We have to repeat it, because in Oslo, in Norway, in the, uh, Western uh, countries, the Islamist is repeating every day. And therefore, we have to repeat our message about equality and justice. We have to repeat it every day because Islamists in Oslo, before when I was young, my father and a lot of other Pakistani, they started col uh, uh, grocery shops, shops in every corner. We make money from groceries, shops. No. Islamists make mosques and all, every corner and make money. So Pakistani has turning, turn uh, business. No, it's mosques. But it uh, uh, don't have to be any problem. But the problem are, are because they are very conservative. They are, and they have a very easy connection with young people. They, uh, beg them to come and offer them pizza and uh, everything. And some of the Salafists, we know what they stand for. They make our young against the society and the society what we love. The Norwegian society is based on equality. And equality, that's what, uh, what, uh, what makes peace. For three months ago, I was threatened. Uh, I, I got a death threat from my own nephew in Pakistan. But it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me, because what's going on there? 
I have big family in Pakistan, but I can't talk to them about religion. I can't, because then it, it, it make difficulty. They said, you are our bl blood. Come talk to us, no problem. Visit us, but don't talk about religion. But I have to talk about religion, because now people are uh, getting lynched at the streets in Pakistan. And Iran, we know everything. Saudi Arabia, we know. But Pakistan, the last 40 years, go that direction. That's why I started to write. But my sister, my younger sister, started before me. And what a genius she was. First, I was a brother. I was conservative when I was 16, 17. I stopped her from her boyfriends and that. But when I get myself a girlfriend, I started thinking. But I also started thinking because this um, land give me same rights. So I was started thinking, I don't give my sister same rights. But this country, uh, anti-racist country, give me everything. I don't feel that I have black hair in this land. But I try to control my sister. What's going on? And then I have university, and I study some philosophy, and everything um, uh, fell on the right place. I understood. And then I also understood why this country includes me. But I don't include, include this country, this white people, or my sister. And my elder sister, uh, elder than Shabana, one day she came to me, why are you so angry at us? What's your problem? So I said, yeah, why am I controlling this? And then Shabana uh, come out uh, as an activist, and I was her biggest fan. And she told me that it's so good to have brothers and sisters supporting her, because one thing surprised us when I also started writing. The Pakistani community, the Muslim community, went against us. I didn't understand, because we were trying to show a liberal a peacemaking, a, we, my sister and we. But the Pakistani community didn't accept us. And of course, they didn't accept when Shabana showed her but, <laughs> and we got uh, shot in our restaurant. I came to work that day, 11 o'clock, when we was coming to restaurant, I see a lot of bullets. Because we have windows going like this, and bullets, I think it's 17 or 18. And it was a, a machine gun which was used, it's so powerful, it go through the bar. Uh, that was a hard wood. Go to it, but they shot at the night. But one, uh, one thing I learned that day, when the guests come, Norwegian guests, they weren't afraid. They sit at the, uh, uh, they, want to, uh, they don't want to sit inside, they want to sit with the, the windows. We want to show you support, they said. And then understood more of what kind of uh, society we are living in. They are brave. And that I learned that my sister was brave. And all you people are brave, because to talk about equality, it's surrealistic, but we have to be brave to talk about equality. What's going on? <laughs> so uh, it's a great pleasure, honor for me to be here. And I said hello to Ibn Warak. It was a great pleasure for me to meet you. But in Pakistan, these are the heroes. But they can't be there as heroes, so something is very wrong. We don't have heroes, which we should have as heroes. Our heroes is Islamist. So what is going on? Uh, we had a scandal here in the Norway. Um, our uh, cultural and uh, equality minister, she has Pakistani background. We had Pride Month. And she was carried away. She took in Shabana and showed her tits, boobs. <laughs> so she was uh, brave. I said, wow, I didn't expect that. Because she has never uh, partic uh, participate, uh, participating in these issues. Suddenly, in pride, woo! <laughs> I go, wow. But later, she excused. 
She said, I didn't know that these pictures was going all around, and that will st uh, make so much disturbance. Huh? You have Pakistani background, and you didn't know that your boobs <laughs> will make disturbance? In Oslo, where we have mosque in every corner. And she was excused, no, I wait so much, I, I don't have so a nice uh, body. What are you saying? Shabana never excused. She said. <laughs>
it is a cause for celebration, particularly the celebration of blasphemous women at the center of change. I know that the history of blasphemy is considered to be predominantly male, but I would argue that it is female. Because being a woman in and of itself is an act of blasphemy. Can, can you not do that? We're being serious. <laughs> cut! Cut! Take that out of the slide. Our body, our hair, our eyes, our voice, our sexuality. It's a deviant form of man before we even think and speak. Not individuals in our own right, but extensions of male guardians and honor. A deviant form of man to be rectified only by ensuring silence, obedience, submission through mass violence, not seen and not heard. Much of women's blasphemy has been and continues to be erased and made invisible. Just take, for example, the witch hunts of the 15th to 17th century in Europe, where thousands of women were burnt at the stake. Many were killed because they refused to submit to patriarchal controls. Until the 18th century in Europe, countless others were put in skulls bridles. It was an iron muzzle that enclosed the head, was slid into the mouth, and pressed down on the tongue, often with a spike, so as to cause immense pain to scare and intimidate women into submission. I would say it's a metal version of the hijab and borga. Yeah. Silvia Federici in her book, Witches, Witch Hunting and Women says, witch hunts were legally approved, religiously sanctioned, mass assaults on women's bodies. Women's crimes were exaggerated to justify horrendous punishments as effective means to terrorize society, isolate victims, and discourage resistance. Used to control female sexuality, which was seen as a social threat, needing to be repressed into acceptable female social behavior. Doesn't this all sound so familiar? How many women have been similarly killed, shunned, erased, imprisoned, persecuted, silenced, on a mass scale, by the Islamists as we speak, by the Christian right, by the Jewish right, by the Hindu right, by the Buddhist right, for the crime of being a woman. Sorry, the, this was wrong. For the crime of being a woman. Is that for the crime of being a woman? Yeah, sorry. I'm getting excited. Targeted by religion and the religious right, obsessed with policing women's bodies, and yet still we rise. Blasphemous women have been at the forefront of challenging the established order and the sacred, subverting the status quo, often at great personal risk. At Celebrating Descent Oslo, we honor them and we celebrate blasphemy, which has throughout history been a catalyst for change. Welcome and enjoy these two days. Thank you. Thank you.